For our message this evening, we'll be speaking out of the book of James, chapter number 1. So I'll give you just a moment to find your place in James, chapter number 1. And I'll begin tonight by reading verses 1 through 16. But I will say that our focus will primarily be on verse number 13 and a statement that is made there. But I want to make sure that we have the proper context in order to set this verse. That way we can properly define and rightly divide the word of truth for us tonight. So if you're in James chapter number 1, I invite you to follow along with your eyes as I read verses 1 through 16. The word of God says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let, him, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err. My beloved brethren, let's have a word of prayer as we look to the Word of God once again this evening. Our Father, we again reiterate the joy in our heart in knowing that you love us, you care for us, that your Word is here to be that light to the path of our lives. And we thank you for today that through the teaching in our Sunday school hour, in the morning, just even through our conversations, we're reminded, Lord, of the truth of your Word that is there to give us all things that pertain unto this life and how to live it in a way that honors and pleases you. Father, tonight as we look at a subject that I believe is necessary and one that it would probably even be more relevant in days to come, I pray that, Lord, you would open our hearts, that you would prepare us to receive your truth, that we would take what we have tonight, meditate upon it, and then seek to apply these very truths in every decision that we make in life. So once again, Lord, I pray for your people tonight that they would be attentive, that their hearts would be open, that they would understand. Give me the proper words. Give me clarification, Lord, on how to lay forth and spread forth your truth tonight. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we can all agree that trials and tribulations are part of the Christian life. They're part of the real Christian experience. Now these trials and these tribulations come in many different shapes and sizes, and it's not a matter of us saying which is bigger or which is smaller, because we know this, that whenever trials and tribulations come into our life, there is one thing that they are always and that is they are always hard. Would you agree with that? Now why is it that we don't 
enjoy the trials and the tribulations that come into our life. And I think the reason that we don't like them is because they pressure us, and we don't like pressure, we like pleasure. We like ease. We like to relax. But our Heavenly Father knows that we need to be strong. these trials and tribulations to come into our life. From the standpoint of God, trials and tribulations are for the purpose of disciplining, developing, and directing us. In fact, if you were to look at this context in which we, of James chapter number 1, you will see that this is exactly his motive. In verse number 3, it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, Now, we all want to believe that we are always people of faith. That we always do what God wants us to do, and we do it with the right spirit and in the right way. And yes, the Bible says that the just are to live by faith, but guess what? We don't always live by faith. And so God allows trials and tribulations to come in, either to remind us that we're failing in that area, or maybe to help discipline us to not... Stop living by faith. We see this brought out where he says that if any man does not ask in faith, but he wavers in this area, or if any man comes to the Lord thinking, well, if I just say this or say that, that God's going to give me what I desire, and brings it all to a head in verse number 8, that a double-minded man is unstable, and underline that word, in all. Not just some of his ways, but all of his ways. We do not have stability in our life when we stop living by faith. And faith is not an emotion. Faith is not a feeling. It is an obedience to what God has told us to do in every situation in our life. Some areas we do good in and other areas we don't. But God allows these tests and these trials to come to reveal where we are weak, but His target is our faith. Another reason God allows these things into our life is because He wants to develop us. Notice in verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That word perfect in verse number 4 implies maturity, a growth. This is what God the Father has predestinated from the very beginning, is that His children would develop into the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't happen at the moment of salvation, that immediately we take on all of His characteristics. We behave like Him, we think like Him. It is a process that we go through. And it is a maturing process that involves trials and tribulations, but God is in the business of developing us and growing us so that we be more like our Savior. And may I say that that will never be accomplished without trials and pressures and tribulations in our life. Then we also see that God allows these trials to come into our life to direct us. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If you ever come against a situation where you don't know what to do, what are you to do? You're to go to God. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I don't know what to do. Give me that discernment. Give me that insight. Give me the strength. Give me the wisdom that I need to navigate this trial in my life so that I may do all things by faith so that I can please you. This is the motive for why God allows trials and tribulations into our life. But at the same time, we must recognize that there is an enemy who lurks around the corner of these trials. And this enemy is ready to offer you a way to escape them. A way to escape and to relieve yourself from the pressures of the trial. And ultimately, a way to reject God's perfect working in your life. You see, every time you face a trial or a tribulation in your life, there is a platform for the enemy's work in the terms of temptation. And so it is no wonder that the Holy Spirit of God 
right after this section on trials and tribulations, he addresses a temptation. It really does fit perfectly because what he's saying here in the beginning part of chapter number 1 is this. Brethren, understand, you will fall into diverse temptations. It is going to happen in your life. And then right after he tells us about these trials and these temptations, he tells us that you will be tempted to respond poorly to them. You'll be tempted to not go through those temptations in a way that honors God. Instead of embracing God's truth, instead of trusting in God's grace, you will be tempted to complain, you will be tempted to concede, and you will be contented, uh, uh, tempta- uh, have that temptation to collapse in your faith. All of those things are part of the temptations. All of those things come when we are pressured and we are pressed in the midst of difficulty. And I'm sure we could agree if we look at our own life that through some of our trials and temptations, we are very quick to complain about them. And we know what God thinks about complaining. There are other times that as we go through those fiery trials that we are tempted just to concede. God, I've had enough. I can't do any more of this. I quit. But the greatest temptation, and the one that I fear many of us are going to face in days and months and maybe years to come, is to have a complete collapse of our faith in the Lord. If you look at verse 13, James writes this. Now understand, he wrote it right after he said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. That is what we are to do when we go through trials and tribulations. We are to endure. We are to endure with the promises of God. We are to endure by the strength and the grace of God. God has given us everything that we need to endure our trials and come out on the other end faithful to Him. And then He, as a bonus, throws on this. There's a crown that He'll give you one day. God is really encouraging us here. He's saying, you can endure. I know that it's hard. I know that it's difficult. But I have given you all these things. Do not collapse when the trials arise. And then verse 13, he says, Let no man say when he is tempted. What is our greatest temptation? I am tempted of God. I am tempted of God. Listen, brethren, as the days become more and more evil, We as God's people need to be aware of a great danger that we face. And that is that temptation to collapse to the point that we believe and maybe even we communicate that it is God's fault on why we're going through difficulties. It is God's fault why our lives are being drastically affected. That God is the tempter. When he's not. And so this evening, I'd like us to consider what James has to say about this temptation and how we are to confront it in the midst of our trials and our tribulations. First of all, I want you to see where this temptation comes from, or more specifically, where it does not come from. It does not come from God. Verse 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. James makes it very clear to you and I that it is not God who is to blame. It is not God that we should point the finger at when we make decisions that go contrary to His word, when we behave in a way that is in disobedience to His commands, it is not God's fault. 
He brings it right back. He says, this temptation develops and is conceived within you. May we remind ourselves tonight that we are sinners. We have a sin nature, a fallen nature, and that sin nature makes sinful decisions. Now I know that it's also part of our nature that we like to point the finger at anybody and everybody. It's their fault, it's not my fault, it's their fault, not my decision. And my friend, you can point the finger at God, you can point the finger at the devil, you can point the finger at the world, but guess what? You made the decision. No one makes a decision for you on whether you're going to endure or not. Whether you're going to be faithful to God or not. It is a personal decision. And you're either going to make a decision to honor God by enduring your trials, or you're going to disobey God by seeking those ways of escape. And we know that there are many different ways to escape our trials, are there not? And so you must be mindful of a battle that rages within you. And not just be mindful of it, but actually do something about it. See, maybe even tonight there's that battle that is raging in your mind and in your heart. You're looking at the circumstances of your life and the things that you're going through and and you're not viewing them in the proper way. You're not viewing them through the lens that God would have you to view them in, but you're starting to listen to all these other things and you're developing a mindset that is very dangerous that will lead you down the road of complaining or conceding or just collapsing altogether. And so it's not enough that we're just mindful there's a battle within. We have to determine in our heart, I'm going to do something about it. So the question is, what do I do when I'm mindful of this temptation? Well, here's number one. Guard your thoughts about God. Are you awake tonight? Guard your thoughts about God. Here's something I want to stress with you. There is nothing more important in your life than how you think about God. See, as we think, so are we. And if we have a wrong view about God, it's going to lead to a wrong thinking about God. And if we have wrong thinking about God, we're going to start living in a way contrary to God. In fact, that's why our world is in such a mess, is it not? Our world has such a distorted view of God. You read Romans chapter number 1 and God very clearly tells us that all men know that there is a God. But they know God, but they make this choice, I'm not going to glorify God, I'm not going to worship God, I'm not going to seek after this one true God, but I'll create my own type of God. And so man builds his idols, man worships creation, man says that he's a God, and then as he develops that mindset, what happens after that? He gets into all types of perverse and wicked behavior. And that's what's going on in our world, that man is abandoning the very thought of God, very distorted in his view of God, and his life as a result is a wreck. Now, for a Christian, it's not the humanistic theology that causes us to think wrongly about God. But what it is for us, it is the pressure of the trials and the tribulations. It is the demand of those things. See, in the midst of those tribulations, there is a temptation, and that temptation is to think wrongly about God. Say, well, what do you think wrongly about God in? How about this? We think wrongly about God's love. God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. I look at other people and God's blessing them, but yet I continue to struggle, I continue to grieve, I continue to just have one problem after another. If God really loved me, why doesn't He do something? Or sometimes we think this, that God, your ways aren't right. This can't be the path that you've chosen for my life. This can't be what you've ordained for me. Sometimes we wrongly think about God's purpose. Well, what is the purpose of this God? I don't see what you're doing. I don't get it. 
I don't put, I can't put all the pieces together on why you're allowing this. And really it comes down to this, is that we start to wrongly think about God's authority in our life. How quickly the verse is thrown out of our Bible. That we are bought with a price. And we are not our own. We are the possession of Almighty God. And God has all authority to dictate what happens and doesn't happen in our life. This is the thinking that Job warned his wife not to have. After all the trials they went through, losing the children, losing the livelihood, Job sitting there in ashes in agony and pain, and what did his wife come to him and say? She said, Job, retainest thou thine integrity? Are we still going to view God in the same way that we did before this trial? And she had already gone down that dangerous road. She said to Job, let's just curse God and die. And thankfully, Job, as a great testimony to you and I, said, thou speakest as one of the foolish women. We're thinking wrong about this. God does good things for us, but then also there are tragedies that happen in life. It doesn't change who God is. See, in the heat of our trial... The temptation lurks. And when you give in to that temptation, it leads you down a very dangerous path. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. And have these thoughts ever gone through your mind? Where you say, God, because you allowed this trial in my life, you are to blame at least in part, for how I'm behaving. Lord, if you didn't allow this to happen in my life, I wouldn't be bitter. Lord, if you would have stopped this, I wouldn't have a problem with anger. Lord, if, I, if you would have interceded on my behalf and spared me that pain and that grief, I would be more faithful to you. Listen... That is the tendency of man. We see this back in the book of Genesis after Adam and Eve sinned. God confronted them, and who was it that he confronted first? It was Adam, wasn't it? Adam, what did you do? And what did Adam say to the Lord? He said, Lord, you gave me this woman. Now the woman was a blessing from the Lord, was it not? I mean, this is what Adam was begging for, I don't know, weeks or months before. Lord, I'm lonely. Lord, I am missing something in my life. Give me something. And God says, fine, I'll give you a wife. Wow, Lord, this is good. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. God, you couldn't do anything better for me. But as soon as he gave in to temptation, who did he blame? God. Listen. It is possible to go through fiery trials and not come out of them more spiritually perfected than when you entered them. And sadly, because many Christians have not guarded their thoughts about God, they bear the marks of bitterness instead of the mark of grace. See, brethren, trials are intended to beautify us. Just listen to some that have gone through trials. Job said this, He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The Apostle Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What would make Paul make such a statement? It's because he heard the word of God who said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The Apostle Peter writing to the suffering brethren in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7 said, That the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, 
though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter did not dismiss the fact that trials are difficult, that they are hard, but he said they are more precious than that of gold. What God is going to do in you is far greater than the suffering, is far greater than the difficulty. But yet there is always this temptation when we go through trials, and that temptation is to blame God. To say, God, you've done something terrible in my life. God, you've allowed something that is detrimental in my life. And that comes because we do not guard our heart. And we do not guard our thoughts about God. Now I want to ask some questions of you tonight. First of all, to whom would we ever say such a thing. To whom would we ever say God's to blame for who I am now? Well, I think the first and most dangerous audience is the audience of self. See, before you ever you open your mouth and communicate something that is foolish, your mind has already entertained it and your heart has already believed it. And what a foolish thought it is to think that God allowed a trial in your life in order to harm you or to destroy you. Now again, brethren, this is not something that is foreign to us. I know you're looking at me like I don't know what you're talking about. But I know, I know myself and I've seen some things in the Word of God that has indicated that God knows that we're not fooling Him. In fact, in the days of Israel, when Israel went into the 70 years of captivity, they, they had pushed God to the limit, and the final prophet, the prophet Jeremiah, was there warning to the very end, and the Babylonians then entered into the city, destroyed Jerusalem, took everybody captive, and now God said, 70 years you're going to be in bondage. And they looked to God and said, God, what, what's up with this? God, don't you love us? Aren't we your people? Aren't we the apple of your eye? Why are you putting us in bondage for 70 years? And God reminded them of some things. First of all, he reminded them in the book of Jeremiah, he said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Do not question my love of you. I have always loved you and I will continue to love you. But in Jeremiah chapter number 29, he gave a very specific statement to them in their moment when they were saying, God, why are you doing this to us? And I want you to listen to what God said. Jeremiah 29 verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. What is God saying there? He says, after 70 years are done, I'll let you come back to the land of Israel. But then look at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Can I just paraphrase what God's saying there? He's saying to the children of Israel, letting you go into captivity is the best thing I can do for you. Say, so how do you get that, preacher? Well, when Israel got out of Babylon, a lot changed. Number one, idolatry was finally broken in Israel. Israel had been playing around with idols for a long, long time, since the days of Joshua. But when they got out of Babylon, they made a decree, no idol will be found in Israel. It was after this time that synagogues started to pop up because they didn't have the temple of the Lord anymore. And people got back and they started reading and studying the law of God again. It was during that time that through men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
that high-profile leaders in the world got saved. And the power of God was demonstrated in the pagan nation of Babylon. That's what God wanted to do. Sometimes we question why God puts us through things. But I'll tell you this, my friend, God always has a reason. And it's always a good reason. He never does it for our evil. He does it for our good and for the good of others. And so what needs to happen in our mind is we need to stop entertaining this fake news that God is against us, that God is trying to destroy us, that God somehow is being unfair to us, that God is being unloving or unjust because He's not. And a good scripture to commit to memory is 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 5. Let me read that for you very quickly here. First, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 5 speaking about the battle and the warfare that is not in the flesh but in the mind, he says this, casting down imaginations. That's an imagination to think that God doesn't love you. It's an imagination to say that God is against you. It's an imagination that, so, that says that God is somehow trying to destroy you. What does Paul encourage us to do? He says, cast that down, destroy that. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. What do you know about God? Does not the Word of God declare that He's a loving God? Does not the Word of God declare that He's a God that can help you? Does not the Word of God declare that He is just and kind in all of His dealings? So whatever does not fit the character of God, cast it down. Get rid of it. Don't entertain it because it's going to lead you to that temptation where in foolishness you'll say, God, you've tempted me. God, you're the reason I'm not where I should be. It's not God's fault. What He does, He does in love. So whom do we, to whom would we ever say such a thing? I'll tell you this, who we're saying it to is self. It's those little pity parties that we have. It's those moments where maybe no one's around and we're just feeling bad for ourselves and what we're going through. And we're going through the woe is me and life is so tough and things are so hard. And we start getting these crazy thoughts in our mind. And the Bible says you need to stop it. Because there are things coming, brethren, that are really going to pressure you and test you. And if you can't guard your thoughts about God... Oh, my friend, you're doomed. Second question. Why would you ever say such a thing? Why would we ever say that I'm tempted of God? Well, let me ask you, what motivates people to blame God in the first place? Anger. God... Why did you do this to me? God, why didn't you stop it? We get angry with God. If you're here Wednesday night, we were reminded of the story of Jonah, weren't we? Jonah just flat out got mad at God. God asked him, why are you, why are you angry? Why have my reasons, God? Anger is oftentimes what motivates us to say such foolish things. But not only anger, but pride is at work. I'm amazed how many Christians think that they're above trials. How many Christians still believe that life should just be easy? That it should just be a breeze, that there shouldn't be any difficulty? And so when difficulty comes, they develop this attitude, Well, God, I don't deserve this. I'm faithful to serve you. I read my Bible, I pray, I witness, I give, I, I come to church. Lord, I'm doing all these things. And the more that I do for you, the harder it seems to get. I don't deserve this, God. Well, first of all, that shows your ignorance of the Word of God. Because all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Peter said, don't think it's strange when you have difficulties and problems that come up in your life. It's all part of the normal Christian life. 
But many times when anger and pride begins to overtake our heart, that is exactly what we do. We try to excuse our own bad decisions. And here's what we do, and this is kind of amazing. We turn holy God into an unholy tempter. Let me say that again. We turn a holy God into an unholy tempter. Do you realize that's exactly what Satan is? In Matthew chapter number 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness, the Bible says that the tempter came and tempted him. In 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5, Paul is saying, I'm praying for you as a church and I'm concerned about you, lest the tempter will tempt you. Who is he speaking about? He's speaking about the devil, our enemy, Satan. He is the unholy tempter, not God. But yet when we say such things, is that not what we're saying? God, you're to blame because you did this to me. Can I just say, we say a lot of dumb things out of anger and pride. Now, I'm grateful that God is a forgiving God and a merciful God. And when we come to Him and say, Lord, I, I already put the bar of soap in my mouth. I already know I was speaking dumb here and I just need you to forgive me. I'm glad that he forgives, but my friend, we better be careful about what we say. Because the third question is this, what do those words represent? Well, when you think about these things, or you express these thoughts to others, what are we doing? What are we doing when we say that I am tempted of God? What we're doing is we're blaspheming God. We're slandering Him. We're mischaracterizing Him. We're assigning something wicked to the nature of God. And that is blasphemous. See, James makes it abundantly clear. Notice what he said in verse 13 at the end. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man. So the first part of the verse is absolutely untrue. The second part is true. Not one of us should ever say, I am tempted of God. God is doing this in my life to destroy me, to trip me up, to cause me to be unfaithful, to lead me into sin. James just flat out says that's not true. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God is holy, God is perfect, God is pure. And in fact, that phrase there, cannot be tempted, is translated into one word, and that is the word untemptable. God is untemptable. He is without temptation. Listen, brethren, not only must we guard our thoughts about God, but we need to get a grip on who God really is. God is not like us. We tempt people all the time, don't we? We provoke people. There's not a married couple here tonight that doesn't know what tempting their spouse is all about. We know how to push each other's buttons. We know how to stir the pot. We know how to cause contention. We know how to get people to show their bad side. God's not like us. God is not like Satan that comes and is constantly pressuring and pushing us, do this, do this, do this, go against God. It's okay, you'll not be found out. You won't have consequences. God is not like man and God is not like Satan. He is not wicked. Amen? Verse 13, the word tempt simply means to entice or to provoke to evil. So let no man say that when I am provoked to evil, that I was provoked by God. Does that make sense to us tonight? That's what James is saying. When 
you're tempted to do evil or you're giving in to those temptations, don't say that it was God that did it. And we understand how this temptation works. We go back to the Garden of Eden. When Satan tempted Eve, how did he do it? Well, he enticed her to disobey God by deceiving her. And deception is always part of temptation. He came to Eve and he said, Well, Eve, this is what you should do. Take of that fruit and eat it. It'll be good for you. You enjoy it. It'll bring pleasure into your life. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and when, you, <clears throat> my goodness, somebody's going to have to come finish the message here. When she believed Satan's deception, sin was conceived in her heart. And she chose to disobey. Go back to James. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted with God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But, here's how it works, brethren. Every man is when it, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's how it works. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but I'll tell you this, if you're thinking of bailing on God, that's not what God's telling you to do. You may be grieving and struggling within tonight, and maybe you're saying, well, I just need to kind of back off and take, take it more easy because things are hard right now. That's not the word of the Lord. If you're entertaining all these thoughts, well, God doesn't really care about me. He doesn't love me. He's not interested in what's going on in my life, so why bother reading His word? Why bother even lifting up words to Him? Those aren't coming from God. They're coming from another source. But here's the thing. If you do what you're entertaining, it's your choice. Don't turn around and blame God for the consequences that come into your life because you disobey Him. You entertained it. You acted upon it. And when sin is done, what does it do? It destroys. God never deceives or tricks people. When He says that you can endure these trials, He means it. When He says that His grace is there to help you endure, He offers it. Because God is truth. And I believe that just as it was in the Garden of Eden, so it is today. Deceptive messages are everywhere. We've never, at least in my lifetime, I've never experienced so many things that have targeted my very thoughts of God and what He's doing as what we're hearing and seeing today. And my friend, we are most vulnerable when we're in the deepest times of our distress. And we could go down a long list of things tonight of what may be distressing us. But I want you to know that in that distress, what lurks around the corner is this temptation to just collapse in our faith. And say, well, God, you allowed this to happen, and I'm just going to walk away. But what does James say? Do not err, my beloved brethren. Don't cave to the pressure. Don't let the message of the world, the lies of the devil, the feelings of the heart, wear you down to the point where you think that God's against you. 
that God has abandoned you. Because he hasn't. He still very much loves you. He is still very much that present help in our time of need. And he is still the God who knows how to deliver us from every trial and tribulation. I'm going to leave you with Psalm 34. Just want you to listen. Just listen to what the psalmist says and see if it applies to you tonight. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are opened unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. That's God's message to you tonight.